Hello, and welcome to another episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon. Today, we are going to be revisiting how to start your story, how to introduce your characters for the first time, where to start your story. And we're going to be revisiting it because far, far too often, far too often, in both published and unpublished works, I run across people who start their story too late. And then you end up with unengaged readers. And also because we do have our opening chapters of the <laughs> book that we're working on together. So it'll let us go through and kind of show that off as well. Yes. So you'll get to see the first two chapters of Magic Falls from the Sky. Or at least the openings of the first two chapters. <laughs> Knowing us, we won't get past the first two pages. Right. <laughs> Before we get into that, if you like what we do here, you want us to continue, please go ahead and hit that like button. I'm Marie Mullaney. I write stuff. And with me as always is Drake. I also write stuff. And we live for your likes. So, you know, we're, we're going to die without them. Click, 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 click. You'll be saving. You'll be saving our lives. Absolutely. <laughs> so I think what we're going to do, what we talked about doing is we're, so we've already edited at least some of these chapters. They're yeah. still in the works. They're still definitely not final draft in any stretch of the imagination. Okay. But we both have done our puke draft and then shared it with each other and then went through and um edit it and we both have strengths and weaknesses i mean that's that's one of the nice things about writing with someone else and again it's why i stress being in a writer's group you need other eyeballs looking at your stuff and so um you'll see you know a fairly big difference between the the puke draft versus the edit draft on both of ours um we don't have the same weaknesses which is awesome because it means that my strengths can fill her weaknesses and her strengths can fill my weaknesses um and if you can find a partner like that, that's literally a match made in heaven. But that's kind of what we'll do. We'll just go through and kind of show you the difference between the two and what we were thinking. And we'll probably only do it with the first page of each, but hmm. just kind of talk about. And, and if you're listening on podcasts, you may want to um, find time to go back and do this on YouTube because we are sharing the documents and you can actually see them side by side, but we'll be reading this out loud. So hopefully you'll get yeah. it. But if you if you do want to do dig a little deeper, I would recommend that you hit YouTube and then follow us on YouTube and you know subscribe. Subscribe. And all of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So when I do my first draft, I tend to focus on getting down the action and the dialogue with maybe the the emotional physical reactions. I very rarely go into the character at that point. I'm just getting the structure down well so the funny thing is just to show the writer's journey when i was your age and i mean age as a writer mm. um and it was time in grade i did the same exact thing your raw writing right now mm. was the exact same as my raw writing probably 10 12 years mm. ago so it's not you know, when we get into mine and I, you know, cause I do write a lot mm -hmm. more emotional hooks and a lot more, you know, of the descriptions and everything. Even in my puke draft, I'm, I'm doing mm -hmm. a lot of that now. It, it, it'll still increase as I go through and edit and, mm -hmm. and add stuff to it. But this is just a, also a great thing for people to look at and go, oh, so technically me and you are the same kind of writers. We're just at different points on that path. I'm a little further mm -hmm. down the road. And so... I do believe that you will not write this way a year from now, two years from now, four years from now, whatever. You'll start getting more and more and more of this in your puke draft because it just happens. It comes naturally. And yeah. so, and you'll see it. And and if you're looking at the screen, you'll notice that we have the old version on the, um, on the right-hand side. Um, I think depends on how it flips the screen or whatever, but uh, the the old version starts with hand shaking. The new version starts with Buri Zurin. The new version so, has a lot of edits in it, so it's all red. Yes. Um, yeah, that's something I don't know if I. So you've done that since since I've known you, where you leave the track changes on and you do your stuff there. I that's because I, I work with that. my that's because I work with my editor in the live document. So when he leaves me comments. 
then I will I will edit once he starts it working on the pages on the edits. I will when whenever I'm making edits, I will put it with review changes on. And mm-hmm. then as he goes through them, he accepts them. And that way he knows that he doesn't need to reread the whole document. He just reads the parts that have changed. Ah. And right. and he accepts them as he goes through. And then I know that he's read them. So last uh, night in my open QA, I made a joke about how I work. A guy gets hired to paint stripes on the highway. And the first day that he's there, he does like 10 miles of striping. And it's his hmm. boss is blown away. No one's ever done that much. And the next day, he only does five miles. And the next day, he only does two miles. And the next day, he does a half a mile. And the next day, by the, by the end of the week, he's only doing like three feet. And his boss is like, I don't understand. Like the first day, you you just blew everybody away. And the guy says, well, the paint keeps drying on my paintbrush by the time I get all the way out there. <laughs> and so that's kind of how I work. I always start over from the beginning. So the deeper I get into a project, the slower I get because I keep going back. And it was the same way when we were plotting. I would always go, nope, I started yeah. act one and let's work our way back through because yeah. I need it, it. It helps me. And I don't reread the entire novel. Mm. It's just how I work. You know, I, I just I need that backtrack and I don't read the reread the whole novel as I'm writing it, but I do read massive chunks of it. So I always go back three, four five chapters and and kind of go through and because I do, ed, you know, I'm editing every draft, too. So I'm not just like just rereading it. I'm also editing and and that's kind of how I work. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a slow. I'm a fast writer. Usually uh, Marie might argue that point after this last week because I've had like 15 minutes to write over this last week that I was supposed to write in the whole week. So I've written like, I don't know, 2,000 words maybe uh, this week and I was supposed to get like 5,000 done. So um, I'm a bit behind. But um, normally I'm a fast writer and then a very slow editor is is where it comes to. So anyway. Okay. So if we take these two side by side, so my first kind of paragraph or two was handshaking Buri's Ren opened the oven. Heat washed over her and she closed her eyes, turning her head aside. She sniffed the steam, too scared to look. Nutty flavors mingled with cinnamon spice and Buri rested her head on the edge of the countertop for a moment, her knees suddenly weak. Mrrr, a feline head bumped against hers. She patted the teacup without looking, gliding her hand over the soft furry head, but avoiding the fliat's wings. At least it didn't burn this time. She shooed teacup away from the cavernous oven mouth and slid the heat-resistant gloves on. Muttering soft coos, the fliat leaped off the counter and snapped his wings once. He flapped up to his platform and curled the bushy yellow and blue tail around his paws. Now, the contrasting on the other side is there's a lot more description in here and a lot more direct emotion. So Buri Zuren opened the oven with shaking hands. Heat washed over her and she closed her eyes, turning her head aside. She sniffed the steam, too scared to look. Nutty flavors mingled with cinnamon spice and Buri rested her head on the edge of the countertop for a moment, her knees suddenly weak. So Mar- just to, just to mm. kind of stop there. Mm. Um, so very little was added to this paragraph. You really just, you just switched around handshaking is all you did. Yes. So they're, they're pretty much identical. Yes. For those the opening paragraph. Yeah. Um, but then it goes, um, she patted a uh, teacup without looking, gliding her hand over his soft furry head, avoiding the fleet's feathered wings. At least it didn't burn. The yellow heat-resisting gloves slid over her red hands. Black lines snaked up her arms like dark vines growing in her flesh. The mark of half adaption to the radiation that soaked the air outside the dome. So there is some very direct world building. And Mm -hmm. it's important because a lot of people are described as being red and black in this chapter. And it's important to understand that Buri is also red and black. Otherwise, it comes across as like a different, you know, like people will assume that she's not. Right. So exactly. you need to establish that kind of upfront. Buri shape shoot teacup away from the cavernous oven before he tumbled into it. Uh, and he fl- flutters away. But then 
we come to the part that's really changed. So in the first edition, it said the tray of teacups looked perfect. Brown dough with just the right color and cinnamon sugar caramelized on top. She set them down on the cooling table and hauled out the steglass lined bottle of Jiren from the ingredients cupboard. Okay. Now that's a fine workmanlike paragraph, but the contrast is the tray of cupcakes looked perfect. Brown dough with just the right color and cinnamon sugar caramelized on top. Pins and needles tingled down her arms. Have I actually done it right this time? She set them down and squeezed between the cooling table and the mixing counter toward the ingredients cupboard. Heat lingered in the cramped kitchen, clinging to the steel surfaces and soaking into bare concrete patches between the broken tiles. The mixing bowl accused Burry of neglecting her cleanup chores from the sink filled with now tepid water. She ignored it and hauled out the steglass lined bottle of Jiren from the ingredients cupboard. So now we, one of the things that uh, that I kind of pushed Marie on when we first read this to have a dichotomy between the two characters, because if you've been following along on the plotting, you know that one is very wealthy and the other is not very wealthy. And so I wanted to make sure that we did little things and it's it's little things like this that just make me giddy. So like the squeeze between the cooling table and the mixing counter, like showing that things are cramped. She even uses the line, heat lingered in the cramped kitchen. We also show um, that there's broken tiles and there's bare concrete patches and like not everything is in this pristine shape. And you'll see when we get to the next chapter, mm -hmm. how that dichotomy plays out. So it's not even just thinking about the chapter you're in. It's also thinking about what you're trying to accomplish. Because, um, you know, this is you know, there's several things about this story that we're playing with. You know, it's obviously fish out of water for both of them going to a place they'd never been. But it's also two worlds collide. You know, mm -hmm. it's this, you know, very wealthy, privileged side of this world. And a, I mean, she's not broke and poor. She's more lower middle class, but still lower middle class versus the 1%. Um, yeah. There's a large gap between the two of them. And a lot of things, and, and it's so important because, there's so much story that we told story is told through conflict mm -hmm. and, you know, making sure that we really push that. So in our first draft, you know, just getting the, the words down, which is fine. Again, this is our first puke draft, no editing, no nothing. You're literally looking at the raw, um, you know, stream of consciousness stuff, which mm -hmm. is always nerve wracking for an author. It's going to be the same for me when we get to mine. I hate showing my puke draft. Um, so, we were at the Jiren in both of them. So if we look then at, uh, at so in, in the first draft or in the puke draft, she says, a tiny line of silver collected in the bottom of the transparent container, maybe enough for one more batch. Buri bit the inside of her cheek. She had to get more Jiren, else she'd lose what few customers still patronized Zuren's magical confectionery. Teacup glided down from the ceiling to her shoulder. Buri scratched behind his ears. Well, I have enough to ice this batch. This is a great first draft here. It's it's setting the stage for what needs to happen. We we know we need to set up. So so what we're trying to do. So I call it the hook. You have to have a hook at the beginning of the of the book. The hook is not the hook of the plot. A lot of people misunderstand that. It has nothing to do with hooking the characters into. You know, oh, they're going to fight, you know, a deranged AI who's trying to, you know, mutate all the humans. I got to get that in my first page. No, no. The hook is what what they mess up. What so many people mess up with is what is the character when the camera turns on? What are they in conflict with? And it could be anything. Um. So, you know, this, the conflict is she's broke. She's broke and she's struggling. And obviously she's not very good at her job. We don't know why yet. We haven't gotten to the fact that it's actually her sister's shop. And, and you know, she's filling in because her sister has taken ill and it has this weird, you know, illness that she's struggling against. And so we'll get to that. 
but the conflict, the hook is something that everyone can relate to without worrying about it being in a fantasy setting or a new world or or even just a whatever, a different time, different place, different body, because everyone can relate to doing a job and not being very good at it and finally doing it right for the first time and not believing in yourself. Everyone can relate to, you know, where am I going to get the money to get this next piece of my life done? Mm. And so these, you know, the, the hooks are there. But what I wanted to do is like, you'll see in the rewrite, the, the big thing that I was like, okay, but this is an opportunity to, you got these hooks in, but you're introducing magic also for the first time. So we can really expand upon that and kind of show some of that. So. So the, the edited portion is she, she ignored it and hauled out the Steglas lined bottle of Jiren from the ingredients cupboard. The protective film turned the container dark and she had to hold it up to the light flooding from the bare bulb on the ceiling to see inside. A thin line of silver dust collected in the bottom, the bits humming without tune, waiting for Buri to give them shape. She chewed on the inside of her cheek. Without Juren, she might as well scratch out the middle part of Zuren's magical bakery. And then she'd lose what few customers still patronize the bakery. Those who haven't left because of my, how did her sister put it? Unique cooking abilities. So now we start introducing, I would do, I, I, there's one edit. <laughs> you got bakery twice. Yeah, I know you saw it because you stumbled over it. <laughs> uh, still this batch looked pretty tasty. despite. And then basically, um, oh, sorry, there is one more hook that comes here. So still this batch looked pretty tasty despite her best effort. Maybe good enough that she could scrape together the money for Rajat's second payment. She really didn't need the loan shark breathing down her neck. Now we've got so, you know, more hooks, obviously. And the reason for the Rajat thing was uh, she does have that in her puke draft. It was just later. And so I was like, mm. this kind of comes out of nowhere. There's, there should be a more organic way we can bring this in sooner so that when it does hit us, it, it has more impact. And yeah. so yeah. that's that's a lot of it. It's going through and 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 like that edit, obviously, I didn't say right here when we were reading this the first time um, together, I didn't go, oh, this is where you need to do Rajat because I didn't know Rajat existed. It wasn't until, you know, a page or two down that I hit Rajat and I was like, man, there's gotta be. And then we went back and we were like looking, it's like, oh, you know, right here, this would be somewhere in here would be a great place to add this. So actually I think how the discussion around Rajat went was you said, you can't keep, you can't keep this reference here. Um, it's, it's too out of nowhere. And then I went and found other places to put in more of him. Right. Um, yeah. Because, and, and this is what's important because as the author, like, and one of the things that I asked, uh, like as well, um, to, especially to a couple of people that I showed it to, because I was like, man, I'm world building a lot here. I'm putting in a lot of building, you know, and, and the readers coming in raw. Um, am I doing too much too fast? Because this chapter backs the world building. And as the author, it's impossible to see if you're doing too much. You literally, you cannot or, see. <laughs> or in your case, too little. Yeah. Because yeah. you yeah. err on the side, because you are so sensitive to it, you err on the side mm. of of too little. Mm. Um, I, And this is just my opinion on it. Um, and I actually, we haven't even had this discussion, so I don't even know if you're comfortable with... Mm. The fact that I've had you shove some of this stuff in it because you've had me remove some of mine. Um, because I feel like if it's done organically and it's done a line here and a line there, even if it's in every other paragraph or every paragraph, even these one, it's not like you're info dumping. So to me, like what we have here, you introduce the Jaren and you just expand it just a little bit. You know, the, the humming, like I love the humming without tune waiting for her to give them shape. Mm. That even though that is technically a world building line, it isn't, it isn't like you said, you know, bits humming without tune, waiting for birdie in the shape. How Jaren works is basically they, <laughs> they came from this area. And then, cause that's what so many people will do. Yeah. They will then go into detail about, you know, oh my goodness, I've now introduced this thing and I have to explain how it yeah. works, where it came from, the history of it, you know, all the intricacies of it, or they're never going to understand. Yeah. Doing something like this where it's just like, 
I mean, because everyone understands waiting to be shaped. Oh, obviously, she's going to do something else to it. Yeah. And that's all I need right now. I think one other thing that I want to briefly talk about before we switch to yours is one of the things that one of the people who read this commented on is further down in the chapter, she's in an altercation with a customer who wants a refund. And a messenger comes in and says, you know, you've been chipped, which in this world means you've been called for duty, right? You've been called for civics duty. And one of the people who read it was like, why don't you just cut the whole next encounter, which I'll read now, which is the encounter with Mota, right? Which is, it's about a page and a half. It's a chunky part of the chapter. Um, and it's it's kind of slow. But mm -hmm. it is slow because it introduces the concept of chipping. And the reason why I do that is so that when I have the altercation, I don't have to stop and explain chipped and what that means. Because it is so important that you don't slow down the action with world building. Everything that you use in action and a, a verbal altercation is still action needs to be set up beforehand but but i think that scene does more than i agree with that. you but this person's only read chapter one she read chapter one blind so she doesn't know who mota is <laughs> right? well so I, and, she's, not even, and she's a minimalist yes, yes it brings in mota but one of the things yeah. that, that conversation does is it also really brings in the conflict of her sister and her sister yes. being um literally on the, do yeah. the the doorstep of death um, yeah. in a very bad way. And it really ratchets up why she's broke because she's used all her money on her sister and why it's so important for her to get this money because she is desperate to save her sister's life. So I think it does more than just that. Is it slow? Okay, great. But does it give me so much desire to care about this character? And so that's where I balance things out. Because, you you know, you'll definitely run into readers like that that are like, no, no, action. Give me action, 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 yeah. action. And I'm like, okay, uh, I'm, great. I'll I'm not, get you I'm action. not for those people. <laughs> like that, That's right. not me. <laughs> right. I'll get you action. But, yeah. you know, I need to make sure that you really do care about this character and her plight mm. before we get to that action. Or the action doesn't matter. You know, I've told yeah. the story about, you know, on the podcast about yeah. Patrick Labruto yeah. and my first opening chapter of my first book. You know. I still want to make sure that my characters are loved by the readers so that when the action does slam them in the face, they're, they're mm. invested. Yes. So um, I don't know. Because one of the things that I have been accused of is starting my stories a little too slow. It's one of the reasons why I don't think that I write really good short stories because it's really hard for me to get over that that quickly. I mean, I, I hear people that, you know, like... There's there's a lot of a lot of readers who like fast based starts, and there's a lot of readers who don't. So you know, the big question that I would have asked her was, but do you care enough about Burry to continue reading through the slow stuff to get to the action? Yeah, and I will, I'd be willing to bet she said, oh yeah, no, no, no. I was really invested in the character. At, at the end, at the end of the chapter, she said she turned the page. So I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, yeah. that's good enough. Um. So, so basically, in here, in Mota's section, which, as I said, is, it's quite a long section, it, it sets up that whole thing. And I think that you do need to remember that even in your chapter ones, callbacks, make sure that you go back and you put in the appropriate world building element. So when they have the chipping discussion over here, uh, Oh, a couple of people asked me why I have all why I have compile here. All I have to do is compile the icing to the cake. Well, I have compile because you know it's a computer science term. That's a little breadcrumb about how magic actually works in this world. It it is a little breadcrumb. It's it's a word deliberately chosen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so taking care to avoid his fingers. Uh, okay, she gets okay. He asks her out on a date, and then. Um, Buri says, sorry, Mota, I got to work. My sister went into care after making her last farm chip. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Turning back, he reached for her arm again. How long has she been in there? 
Murray, Murray jammed her hands into her apron pockets. She ducked her head, avoiding his eyes as the heat of a blush spread over her face. He's simply being polite. Would it kill me to do the same? She shrugged. Two months. Mota's brows arched. And she isn't better yet? Buri's fists massaged her stomach and she tried to speak so, normally. So, mm. just make a note. You mm. need a Mota reaction after the first line of 120. So, Buri jammed her pockets in her apron and then the next paragraph needs to be Moda does something that makes her embarrassed, where he'll, he'll, yep, I got whatever. You. He gives her a he gives her a knowing smile, or he, whatever. But so, I'm very sensitive for those listening. I'm very sensitive on the flow of why the characters do what they're doing. So right here, to me, the reason why I stopped her was. To me, I don't understand why she ducks her head and avoids blush. And, and even her next inner monologue is like, he's just being polite. Well, how is he being polite? He hasn't done anything. Mm. Sure, he asked about how her sister was and how long she's been there. And that you could say, well, that's being polite. But it's not enough to, in my opinion, to have created that big of a reaction. Mm. So she needs to. So what happens in the beginning of this, for those that, because we haven't read it, um, she does not like this guy. No. And he likes her. And so he's constantly trying to touch her. Yeah. And she's constantly trying to not let him no. touch her. So this yeah. is about the second or third time this kind of thing has happened. And um, so she reaches again and she's like, I'm just going to put my hands in his pockets. And then mm -hmm. that's why for me, he needs to do something that like he needs to frown, but then give her a sad smile or something like that mm -hmm. so that she can go, damn it. He's just being polite. Like he's not being you know, I'm the one now in the wrong. And then that that reaction that she has back to him now becomes yeah. very understandable. And that is a lot of the conversations that we had when we initially went through the chapter is like this reaction, that reaction, this reaction, because I yeah. have like a reaction from Buri, but no, because in my head, I know what the other character did. <laughs> right, right. Well, and yeah. that's the thing. You know, we yeah. that's yeah. that's why we need other people looking at our work because as exactly. I've, for those that are taking my classes, you've heard me talk a lot about the the book in your head and the book on paper. Yeah. And you don't realize you're writing two books. So to you, it's mm. just one. But externally, we only get the book on paper. Yeah, so we've got your, um, so she shrugged. Uh, so, okay, so she's, she shrugs and says two months and Mota's brows arch and he says, and she isn't better yet. And then Buri's fists massaged her stomach and she tried to speak normally, even though her throat ached. No, I paid for two two more weeks, but his mouth pursed and he shook his head. Don't say they die if they're not better by now. Don't say it. Maybe I can help. I know some people. She'd heard that line before. Stories of miraculous cures for adaption sickness always seemed to swirl around anyone who had loved ones in care. But fanciful tales wouldn't help her sister. Thanks, Mota. Buri's nails bit half-moons into her palms. But I'll figure it out. He patted her shoulder and, and her skin rippled with goosebumps, trying to crawl away from his fingers. Okay, well, you take care. The shop bell dinged again as the door closed behind him. Burry knuckled her eyes. She'd cried herself out over Carly already, five or six times. Her sister had gotten chipped two months ago, the job card putting her on a standard rotation of agri-duty. Farming jobs, done planet side and the protective domes, always carried the risk of adaption sickness. Carly had come back with, with her black lines turning grey, the first sign of her blood turning from red to white. Gulping back the threatening tears, Buri touched the counter display. Buri, Mota's cryptids would buy a little time, but not enough for Carly to spend another week in care. The city had paid for two months. Buri had managed another two weeks, but Carly hadn't gotten better. Adaption sickness ended when the body rejected the mutations or the person became fully adapted and died, their body exploding into fire caused by the radiation inside them. Carly hadn't rejected the mutations yet. What am I going to do? So there is a lot of world building in those paragraphs, but they're all tied in to what has just been discussed, what has just happened, what has just 
going through the character's head. So you can see that there is a lot of world building there. But that world building, and it is kind of tally, but it is also directly tied into what the narrator is thinking right now. Well, that's a that's a great point. I meant to mention this the last time. We didn't have a lot of time to talk the last time we mm-hmm. talked. Um you cannot write a book that's all show. Yeah. Because first of all, world building is almost always going to be telly. There are times where you can work out organic ways to do world building and you absolutely should use those opportunities. But I I have to imagine if you ended up taking every single pit of world building and looking for an organic way to do it, it would turn into such purpley prose that it would be annoying to read. Not only would it be purply prose, but you would be crashed with with dialogue. Your anchor character would have to know right. nothing. Right. So, like before we started recording, I was she had said something to me. Go, oh man, I need to add a line, and you'll see it in the rewrite of my first mm-hmm. chapter. Um, so I'll talk about it then. But when I said it, Marie's response was, "It's kind of telly." I'm like, "There's no other way to do it than that," and it's one line. And it gives such depth into the society in that one line. So yeah. she's right. It is a telly line. But if I looked for an organic way to do that, that would be, uh, as you know, dialogue. So basically, mm-hmm. just to kind of, I guess I should talk about it now. So I want to show the disparagement between. So we're showing the disparagement between Burry and her financial and social status versus Laron's financial status but laron has servants working for him and he's trying to get out of something and as a last ditch effort he actually tells his nanny if you tell him i'm sick i'll give you six months of my allowance and that's what's written right now and the the nanny laughs and says oh stop and then that's it Mm. but i really want to show the difference between laron and the house servants even though house servants are way better off than bury So I want to add a line that'll say something like, uh, it was a generous offer. Six months of his allowance was more than a year of her wages. Mm. Is it telly? Yes. But it instantly in one line goes, wow, this kid with his allowance, not even a job money, just his allowance is twice as much as his, you know, may or his nanny makes. And so it shows, and I could do it as dialogue, but it's but they all know that they would go, you know, I'll give you six months. You know, that's t- more than twice you make in a year. You know, yes, I know. You don't have to point that out to me like that yeah. is so as you know, dialogue, you know, and, and sometimes like I'm I'm by no means am I advocating for tell over show like don't misquote right. this here. Right. Right. But some things you just have to tell. Mm hmm. But make sure that when you're telling it, it's relevant, it's not mm-hmm. in action, and it is quick. Um, quick. It's like that. Even that whole quick, even that those three or four paragraphs there. Those three or four paragraphs are interjected with Bury's emotions, and they're mm-hmm. broken up by her actions, right? Mm-hmm. And then when we get here to the action and she's busy like holding off this customer and saying, I'll I'll get the money together. Give me a few days. I'll pay you back. And Mr. Hadria, her customers, uh, crossed his arms high over his chest and glared at her. After you insulted my home? No, you'll pay me now. And we know she doesn't have the money, right? right. So sick burned it, in the back of without, Bruce's throat. Well, without that, mm. that setup back there, yeah. this is where you'd have to do it. You know, yes. you'd have to say, you'll pay me now. Yeah. And then in narration, you have to say, but she couldn't pay her him now. She, she'd already used <laughs> all her money to buy two more yeah. weeks for her sister who was in hospital. And oh, by the way, what that means is this and what yeah. that, you know, and oh, she could die. And like, exactly. you now have to do all of that stuff here. And then, so when the external rescue comes in now, because now sick burned in the back of Burry's throat and she sucked her cheeks between her teeth. She moved her mouth, but her thick tongue would make no words. The shop bell dinged and a young half-adapted wearing tin sharp precincts red and yellow uniform walked in. The crimson cloth almost vanished against his skin, the yellow highlights seeming part of a starburst pattern of black dots that decorated his face and hands. On his shoulders, the official epaulette sagged, 
the threadbare ghosts of tassels brushing against his shirt. A messenger bag dangled from his back and his tuned shoes made his steps bouncy, the jiren in them agitating for speed. Buri Zuren? That, Buri cleared her throat. That's me. Right, he dug into his bag and produced a slinger, slender rectangle of plastic with gold patterns etched onto it. You've been chipped. There's a nutty fall and you're on Tinshaw's team. you got to report to the elevators in 24 hours with your kit. Expected duty is four days. And we've set up the whole chipping thing already. So I don't need to interrupt the narration here to explain what that means. Yeah, but you, but even more than that, like because you expanded the the way Jiren works and we've even worked it out because you expanded on the icing, you expanded on Moda's bag because mm. he had to have a Jiren infused bag to be able to carry yeah. the cupcake so they don't spoil and all this other stuff. Mm. So now a little line of, you know, his tuned shoes made the steps bouncy, the Jiren in them agitating for speed. That's all I need because I already mm. you've already built in this slower portion. You've mm. already built what you know that clothing is jiren infused and that food can be jiren infused and how it works and we've already seen all that and so yeah you know it's why i'm such a, a huge proponent of of a little bit slower start again can, uh, as long as you have yeah. that hook as long as on that first couple of paragraphs you make me you make me actually invested in some internal conflict mm. that's what the hook is it's an internal conflict of what i'm dealing with right now yeah and in like in laron's case that we're going to find out here in a minute the hook is as petty as you can get like he doesn't want to go for this job interview i don't want to do this i didn't mean to say i was interested and now i've got to do it and i can't get out of it because everyone wants me to do it and my life sucks because oh my god i don't want to do this now like it's so petty compared to you know what we have with Burry but that's kind of the point it's kind of yep. a point to make it petty the, the the last point that I want to make on on Burry um, is that you cannot have fast action without um, without setting it up beforehand without setting up everything you need beforehand so you literally can't so you can but it this comes down to understanding um so like i've shared the chapter 13 from the rewrite of the genesis saga where mm. a lith starts running for her life from three rapists mm. and you're just there and it's the first time you've met her it's the first time you've met her magic but it's chapter 13 yes you know so, the world that's what i mean right. you can't if you have not set up your world you cannot have fast combat because you have to stop the action to explain right. the terms. Right. And if you have that's to stop why, the action to explain the terms, you're done. You've lost all tension. That's why when Labruto wanted me to open the chapter, to open the book with the lion dude in combat, I was so much against it. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, he eventually saw, oh, yeah, this isn't as good, is it? Um, so, you know, that's what we're trying to do here is – you, you you have to think differently as you go through the book. Mm. It's one of the reasons why I like multi-character books, because I can world build certain things with certain characters and then just assume mm. them done in the next mm. character. Yep. So like you'll see in um in my first chapter, I actually have something like she eyed him like a fiat fleot eyeing a rodent. I don't mention that it's a cat. I don't mention that it has wings. I don't mention what color it is. All that's done. It's all done in that last chapter. And I can lean on that because I'm. it's already been set. The audience already knows what a fleot is. We've interacted with one. We've petted one. We've, you know, had words with one. We've, we've saw that they're naughty little creatures that don't listen, um, but they're also cats with wings. Mm -hmm. And so I can just, I can dip into it without even thinking about world building at all. And so that's what you have to do. It's it's all about their building blocks. And remember, as I keep saying, the only thing that's real is the reader. So the reader knows what a fleot is. I don't have to explain to them how Laron knows what a fleot is. 
the reader knows what Jiren is now. The reader knows yep. what tuned items are. Like all of that's been done. You don't have to do it again. But you have to do it before you use it in a action sequence. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So here we are with chapter two. Uh, where do you want to start? Would you like me to read? Would you like to read? No, I'll I'll do. So I'll go with my my puke draft. So mm. you know, for me, as much of as heavy of a plotter as I am, there's a couple things that I do that maybe I shouldn't do. Maybe I should think about plotting a little more heavy. It's just the way I do it, and and it does take me a little longer to get started on some of these projects than than maybe if I'd spend a little time. So like you know, if you follow along on the plotting, you probably notice that. Marie knew Burry way better than I knew Laron. I was still learning because I don't, and I do that for a reason. I don't want to come up with a character that then prejudices the direction that the plot goes. I like to leave my character very vanilla because it wasn't until the end that I really started going, oh, you know what type of character Laron's going to need to be to do this story? He's going to need to be this prissy little rich boy like we we already knew that he was rich and then that wasn't a thing but it, it's still a very different character than originally i was thinking he was by the time we got to to plotting act three what i knew that laron needed to be was very different from what i originally thought assumed that he was going to be and so i do like to leave them a little bit more vanilla while i'm plotting um but then after i plot i'm really ready to start writing so maybe i should you know, heed my own advice and now go and and go to the character sheet and start really writing them up because, you know, because I do that eventually. Once I get to know the character a little better, that's when I pull out my character sheet and start filling it out and fleshing it out. But I don't know, sort of like you where you're like, no, I just want to get a couple chapters done. And then, you know, you do it to world build. You're like, I want to get into the world a little bit to experience the world. I I, I know the world now and I just want to get into the character experience them, which is why I, I rewrite and I rewrite and I rewrite until I get the the really great attitude of this character that I'm looking for. And it's still not there. I'm behind. We just started writing, you know, last week and I've had a really awkward week for writing. I've, I have not had time to write. Like I said, I may have put 2000 words down on paper. Um, yeah. 2,344 to be exact since you have my <laughs> current document open. Um, so I'm still learning the character and, and going through. So when I started, this i just i knew basically what was going to happen in the chapter i knew basically that laron was going to be going to meet his father that he didn't want to do this that his father's a politician that his father wants him to work in 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 his field i know that his mother died at childbirth i know that he's been raised by the staff and a nanny and so i know all this stuff but i haven't plotted out how to lay it out to the reader so i just start in my head, the first thing I saw was I really want to show the difference between Burry's cramped quarters and Laron. So the initial scene that in my mind was he's walking down this very wide, lav lavishly decorated hallway and just start there. And then you'll see when we get down, I'm going to stop after the first page and shift over to the thing. Why when Marie like said, Hey, you did this. I was like, Oh my goodness, you're right. And and then how it was adjusted in the rewrite. So just to go through this for the first page, mm. Leron Kagul strode down the wide marble corridor, his hard soled boots echoing loudly, expensive vases, rich tapestries and finely crafted paintings lined the walls, but he paid them no interest. Butterflies flitted in his gut as he entered the high balcony overlooking the foyer. His father, Vinya Kagul already stood in front of the massive double doors to, of their estate. The man looked regal in his all-white suit, golden tassels of rank dangling from his shoulders. As if he knew he was being stared at, he turned and looked up. Ah, Laron, hurry down. He'll be here any moment. Running his palms down his own snow-white overcoat, Laron did his best to quell his nerves as he descended the curved stairs. He understood how important this meeting was for his father, and while honored that Vinya had agreed to let him attend the meeting, now wished he could just stay in his room. Why did I ever say I was interested in politics? After all, he wasn't. He was, however, interested in spending more time with his father. At least that's what his nanny told him he wanted. His father had always been aloof. He was a different man after the death of Laron's mother. At least that's what, and I used at least like 30 times through here. <laughs> um, at least that's what, his, what Laron had been told, having never met his birth mother. This meant he'd been raised by the house staff, 
not that he not that he anything not that he had had anything to complain about they all treated him with the respect his station dictated but he was now a man almost anyway and as a man it was high time that he started acting like one at least i'm just gonna scroll <laughs> that's that's what miss yarlin says all this had been her idea, and while he knew she wanted nothing but the best for him, he wasn't sure following in his father's footsteps was a good fit. For what he'd seen, politics was a ruthless cutthroat business, and his father seemed well-suited for the task. Another reason Laron felt so uncomfortable in the man's presence. Still, he loved the woman who'd been paid to raise him as if she were his birth mother and wanted to make her proud. Heck, since his, his mother died before he... He even took his first breath. For all intents and purposes, Miss, Miss Yarlin was his mother, and she wanted him to succeed in the world, and that meant politics. He sighed inwardly, even as he pasted on a smile. Morning, Father. Then you waved him over. Yes, yes, yes. Hurry up. I'm just going to read down to oh, 40. Yep, we're out there. Um, taking his place, Laron stood as straight as his body would allow, pulling his shoulders back. The stance was uncomfortable, but Miss Yarlin had impressed a upon him to do everything by the book today and then this is a flashback dialogue mind your manners speak only when spoken to and for the butcher's sake don't slouch your father has agreed to let you attend this morning if you show yourself able he may take you on as one of his aides no better way to start your career than being the an aide to one of one or being an aide to an old ten sorry councilman so again i'm just figuring things out i know there's a lot of stuff that i need to work in and i'm just trying to puke it onto the page because again no editing on this draft at all this is literally my stream of conscious writing um so when i hit that so i said a couple of things like you know we need to i'll i'll add in some extra world building stuff for like what the vases are and so on because those are things that you know are right so one of the things that i know well one of the things i've always know that i'm bad on is i don't if things aren't important, like I always tell my fans, if I describe a painting and what it looks like, it's very important. There's some key piece of information in that description that you will benefit from if you remember it, that it exists. See, but other than that, that, a vase to me is a vase. You know, See, that's that's true and it's not true because every vase, every picture, every mural, every piece of clothing people put on is an opportunity to world build without telling. I agree. And, and I've learned and, that a lot from you over this last yeah. year and a half. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and that is why I spend the time describing those things mm -hmm. in order to emphasize and re-emphasize. Like we will give the Kagul family a symbol and that mm -hmm. symbol will be on their stuff. And then someday we won't, we will just have the symbol sitting somewhere and the reader will know, oh, it's the Kagul symbol. It means there's something there. <laughs> mm -hmm. and yeah. And so since Maria is such a better world builder than me, I'm absolutely letting her just run roughshod and do whatever she wants with anything, you know, that she wants on this stuff. Because it is something like in the rewrite of Genesis, that's one of the things that I've really made myself have to do is go back and look at clothing and symbols and and, you know, what is it? Heraldry and all this stuff that I just don't give a crap about. I just I don't know, but care. It, it makes it so much it does. deeper. It does. I 100% agree or I wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. I, I, I reached this paragraph and I was like, you're starting this thing too late. Back mm -hmm. up five minutes and show us the conversation. Yeah. And, it's, and again, you're too close to your own writing. And like I said, so here's the thing about this this section. I would love to say that when I went back and reread this for my first draft, that I would go, oh, wow, I started at five minutes too late. Let me back this up. And, and maybe I would have. We will never know because I never got a chance to do it because, again, we're just kind of looking at each other's raw writing just to kind of help speed the process mm -hmm. along and get information in as quickly as possible. And so, you know, she's the one that pointed out, maybe I never would have noticed it. Maybe this paragraph would have stayed all the way to the bitter end, which would have been a shame because it is the wrong spot. Having a flashback in your opening page is just like that. We say this all the time, so it's not even, and that's the thing, you know, that even what you preach, you can miss because you're still too close to your own. Because I know I've said a million times, 
if you have a flashback on your first page, you started in the wrong spot. And I had a mm-hmm. flashback in my story. Now, I think the reason why this didn't bother me, because it's not a true flashback. It's literally just something he was told in the past. So that being said, I probably wouldn't have ever gone back and changed this. But when she pointed out to me, I was like, oh, man, I could start there. And then I could actually do this thing a little better and do this thing a little better. And I could get this information in here. And instead of saying, you know, like all that really telly crap of, uh, you know, loved she this, raised this, him and, and all this and other she stuff. she loved him. And you can show all of that. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Now, the other page is also my first stream of consciousness that has not been edited. Because, again, I'm way behind on this this week. And I've got a convention next week, so I'm going to be even further behind. But hopefully this weekend I'll get a bunch of stuff done. But let's move over to there and kind of look at the difference between the two. Again, first draft, really not even first draft, stream of consciousness draft, puke draft, as as we like to call it, my writer's group. Um, But it gave me the opportunity to, like, I was still trying to figure out how I was going to introduce. He has a an internal companion that I had no way to introduce in this first version. And now I'm looking for ways to introduce it over here. And because it's slower, it's still, he's just getting dressed at this point because I backed it up five minutes. So moving over to to the rewrite, Leron Kagua frowned at himself in the full length mirror. I look like a fool. Don't be silly. His nanny, Miss Yarlin, shifted her robust frame between him and the mirror, blocking the view of his reflection. Then in brush in hand, she eyed him like a fleot would a rodent. You look handsome. She brushed his white co- his snow white overcoat, adjusting bits and pieces of the garment as she worked. You're simply letting your nerves get the better of you. I wish it were that simple. He loved his man with all his heart. She had, after all, been with his family since the day he was born. And today was, impor- was as important to her as it was supposed to be for him. But it wasn't his nerves that were hounding him. It was knowing that this wasn't what he wanted to do. Not that he could tell her. Realizing he had, he held a sour expression, he gave her a, he tried to give her a smile. The sympathetic look she returned said he his attempt failed. Mr. Allen placed both hands on his shoulders and looked him squarely in the eyes. You can do this, she nodded, her grip increasing. I don't need to harp on the fact of what an amazing opportunity this is for you, so I won't. Just be sure you mind your manners, speak only when spoken to. Tucking her hand under his chin, she gently pushed his head up and back. And for the builder's sake, don't slouch. Laron pulled away from her grip with a sigh. I'm not a child, Nan. His words held no strength. And even though he gave her a defiant look, he pulled his shoulders back and straightened his spine. As a distraction, he glanced around his bedroom. She'd made his bed while he showered, stacking the plethora of pillars he, pillows he never used at its head. The two windows flanking it had been opened, a cooling breeze bringing in the scent of and sounds of the garden below, aromas of fresh-cut grass and, and the blossoming flowers of fruit trees mingled with the blurbing of the central fountain and chittering of birds. He turned back to his caretaker and made one more plea for his salvation. And I'm not nervous. It's more that I'm not sure this is the path I want to take. That's just your nerves talking. She returned to fussing over his outfit. Having your fingers on the pulse of Olten Sarin, being the, a leader to her people, what better career is there than being a politician? A soft hum vibrated his arm, but he tried to ignore his ident sleeve. Ghost seemed not to take the hint. Engineer, scientist, programmer, garbage remover. A giggle laced the expert system's di- digital voice that filled his mind. He didn't. He didn't disagree but felt it would be best to keep his thoughts between himself and his friend, companion, confidant. What do you call a disembodied voice that lives in your arm? Back in my day, they'd call me a demon and you'd be burnt to the stake for your sins. Funnily enough, the definition wasn't too far from the truth of what might happen to him if anyone found out about Ghost. Well, I doubt I'd be burned at the stake. Wood is way too valuable for that. But his, dis- but his digital companion was right. It wouldn't turn out well for either of them. Miss Yerlin resumed her fussing over his clothes. If you show yourself able today, tomorrow you could find yourself aid to one of the Olten Sari councilmen and a well-respected one at that. Stepping back, she took him in. She took him in from head to toe before turning him to scrutinize him from every angle. Perfect. Looking past the gray-headed woman, he looked bad. He looked at his image. There's actually been a ton of bad stuff in here. 
it's, uh, it's he fun. looked at his i know it's really hard to read my stuff and not edit me at the same time I know. <laughs> um he looked at his image once more i must admit she isn't wrong the compliment from the expert system took him aback you look like someone from the pages of an adventure story Sure, his white suit fit well, tailored to make his thin frame look more muscular than it actually was. The high collar was a bit constricting, but he'd worn worse. It was all the gaudy accoutrements he felt ruined the look. Large, polished gold buttons ran up the front, flanked by two large gold buttons on either breast pocket. Golden, see, and this is where I wrote pads, and she's going to change it to whatever Eplets. they're actually, huh? <laughs> what are they called? Epaulets. <laughs> Epaulets, yeah. I don't, I don't care. I don't care about clothing. Um, <laughs> so I am being a little weak because normally I might have looked that up while I was writing. I might have actually done a Google search for what they're called. But since I know she's going to come back and just, you know, give me all that information, I'm going to be like, yeah, no, I'm just going to call them pads. Golden pads bedecked with dangled gold tassels perched on each of his shoulders. A gold chain hung from his middle most button to loop its way to a side pocket where a gold timepiece waited. Not that he'd ever used the functional jewelry. A story about a snotty rich kid who dies in the opening scene, paving the way for the rise of the real hero. There it is. There rolled his eyes and shook his head before turning back to Miss Yarlin. I'll give you my allowance for the next half season if you tell me if you tell them I'm sick. This and then that's where I'm gonna put in something about it showing the disparagement between the two. This earned him a chortle. Oh stop. She prodded him to get him moving, then followed as he made his way across the lush rugs covering the floor. You'll do fine. That's what I'm worried about. She pushed him out the door, turning toward the back of the villa and the servant's stairs that led to the kitchens. Laron watched her go. She never turned around, but before she disappeared into the servant's stairwell, she called out one final word of warning. And for all our sakes, don't call the councilman father. His shoulders slumped, but his fate was sealed. So taking a deep breath, he turned and headed toward the front of the villa. And then I basically Riding started in the same the spot. Card. Yep. So just backing it up that little bit. And there's this is still my puke draft. I did not get a chance to go through and edit this. So there's some telly bits that I want to take out. There's more organic ways that I can work in the fact that his mother is dead. And, hmm. you know, again, I tend to be a little bit more telly about information, just trying to get it in. And then I'll look for more organic ways to get it in later. But, you know, it all comes down to the thing that we talk about all the time. Just get it down. Everything can be edited. The hard part is just getting it down, get it down, get to the end of the book. And then you've got time to go back and, and do all your edits. And and for the love of monkeys, do not be afraid of editing. Don't think that you've put it down and it's down on like it's not done. The first right. draft is not the done draft. You can no. change a lot. I mean, if you look at the difference between just these two, just just by going like, wait, wait, actually, I am starting in the wrong place. Yeah, it is literally an entire extra page worth of text, but it is such a great page worth of text, right? It really it introduces Lyron, it introduces Ghost, it makes you feel, and you don't even have to mention that Lyron's mother is dead because you can see it right here. You can see right. it in his relationship with Mrs. Yarlin. Um, you know, it's just it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's the one thing that I think, and I, I feel like we both felt this two years ago when we first met that, mm -hmm. that neither one of us had that pesky artistic pride, mm -hmm. you know, that's what kills so many artists and writers, which is that don't tell me what to do. I'm perfect. No, you're not. <laughs> you are not perfect in any way, shape or form, nor am I, nor is Marie, nor is anyone else in this, in this industry. And everyone can be improved and everyone can be, you know, pushed to that next level. And that's what I crave. And I think Marie craves it as well. I crave that feedback. I crave that, you know, hey, so did you think about you did this and it's OK, but but did you think about doing this that might make it even better? I'm like, oh, my goodness, that's awesome. Just... Or or even better, it's like, oh, that is actually better. But now that you've said that, it's given me this other idea that's even better than that. Yeah. When somebody says, like, this isn't great, they're not saying you're not great. They're saying this part of the story mm. isn't great. So bear that in mind, too, because people yeah. can get touchy. <laughs> like, 
Um, I know someone who's a creative writing teacher and what she does in her class that I love so much at the beginning of the, of the semester, she makes the class stand up for the first week or two. And at the beginning of class, they hold their writing in one hand and they say, they tap the writing and they go, this is my writing. And then they tap their chest and they say, this is me. When someone critiques my writing, they're not critiquing me. This is my writing. This is me. When someone critiques <laughs> my writing, they're not critiquing me. Yeah. And that's, that is great that's, that she does that with her students because that is a mantra to live by. You have to get over it. Yeah. You know, I didn't, when Marie's like, you got a lot of telly stuff in here and a lot of backstory and really you kind of started in the wrong spot. I didn't go, well, screw you. I'm amazing. <laughs> I was like, okay, show me what you're talking about because you know, I hadn't reread it. So I didn't, you know, it was stream of consciousness. I don't remember what I write when I'm in stream of consciousness. And so she's like, well, you have this and you have this, but really my big problem is this paragraph here. Like this tells me that you should have started five minutes. I'm like, yeah, I should have started when they're getting dressed. Like, that's a great idea. And then I literally went back and just started the scene a little bit sooner. And and there's some things that I still have to take out. Like, um, because I was editing this morning on this. Um, and like I already mentioned his. So if you look at the first version, I don't mention what Laron's wearing. So yeah. I mentioned his father's in this white suit. And then when he goes down, I have Laron, you know, run his hands over his own snow white coat. Mm. Well, that's still in the rewritten version because I hadn't gotten to there as I'm doing all my changes. So yeah. I need to take that out because I already have the, shown Ooh, the audience that he's wearing that. Yeah. So now yeah. it's just going to, it can just be something like, you know, he ran his hands over his coat, mm. his fingers tangling in the golden watch chain or something like that so now i can add a different piece of detail to it instead of having to go oh i need to tell them that he's also wearing a snow white coat just like his father over the white on white embroidery of the edge of the coat the flowers of his house rough under his fingers flowers white on white embroidery is amazing flexing that's nice see i never would have come i don't do clothing <laughs> I just don't. But that's, again, and I know I keep harping on this, but that is the beautiful thing about working with other people is that their strengths become your strengths and overcome your weaknesses. As long as you don't have that stupid artistic pride. My weakness is honestly that I I, I don't dig deep enough into the emotions because I'm like, well, I'm showing you the emotions. So I can make up your own mind what these people are thinking. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, 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 and I may go... I may go, and you know, that's one thing that I never really noticed until we started working together. I may go a little bit too far because you've had me pull back on some things that you pointed out I agreed with. Mm -hmm. So like I may be taken because I'm so sensitive to it and want so much of that in there that, you know, yeah. again, that's the beautiful thing about working with people as long as you don't have that stupid artistic pride. So it really, it has been, and it's it's really good for me because like when Drake says, you know, you need more emotion here, you need a better beat here, you need more, you know, then I'm like, uh, fair, let me go put in some beats and yeah. some emotions and some, yeah. Yeah. So what do you think, our audience? What do you think of our first two chapters, what you've seen of them, our openings and uh, starting your story in the right place and putting in that those emotional hooks and building things before the action? Did you enjoy this episode? And uh, let us know in the comments, or if you're listening to this, mail us at releasingyourinnerdragon at gmail.com. And make sure you, you know, like it, follow it, share it. You've got writer friends out there. They will also probably get benefit from this. So share this on your social media. Say, hey, all you writers out there, I found this podcast that seems to be helping me out. You should check it out. Mm -hmm. And we will see you soon for another episode. Bye.